Uh, how does it? Oh. Sorry. Uh, there we go. All right. Can everyone hear me? Um, all great. Okay. All right. So thank you, Rita, for you know um, giving me this opportunity to tell you about my work in the Friedman Lab. Um, the title of my talk today is Sympathetic Nerve Remodeling of Adipose Tissue. And you know, as you can tell from the title, uh, it's at the interface of the brain, fat, and the sympathetic nervous system. All right. So starting. Um, First, uh, bidirectional uh, communication between the brain and the body's organs uh, plays an important role in how the body carries out homeostatic processes. All right, so um, afferent signals from the peripheral organs, such as insulin, or ghrelin, or diponectin, and also sensory neurons in the periphery send signals to the brain to inform the brain of its uh, needs and also uh, the nutritional status of the body. Now, in turn, the body, the brain makes decisions uh, by telling these organs what to do using uh, endocrine uh, hormones, such as oxytocin, a growth hormone that is secreted from the pituitary gland, um, and also the autonomic nervous system, which innervates almost every single organ in the body. Now, the autonomic nervous system is comprised of the sympathetic and parasympathetic arms, uh, which broadly uh, elicit catabolic and anabolic programs respectively. Now, um, although there has been a lot of extensive research over time uh, to map the connectivity between the brain and peripheral organs, um, how and what functions uh, the autonomic nervous system actually regulates in each of these organs is still uh, somewhat unclear. Um, and also, even further yet, we don't know actually very much about whether there is plasticity or remodeling of these autonomic nerves within these organs. All right, so with that, I'd like to tell you about uh, the outline for my talk today. Well, I'll first tell you about how leptin uh, has uh, leptin's physiological effects on energy expenditure and how some of these studies uh, led us to discover an unprecedented role for leptin in regulating sympathetic innervation remodeling inside of adipose tissue. Following which, I'll tell you about the central pathway that regulates this process, and then followed by a short segment at the end uh, discussing some of our findings. All right, so coming back to that bidirectional crosstalk between the brain and the periphery, um, one important uh, hormone that participates in this crosstalk is the hormone leptin which is a hormone produced by adipose tissue um, and whose primary target is the brain. And it's important for the regulation of uh, energy homeostasis, which is a biological process that involves the uh, spending of energy, uh, energy outflow, and also behaviors that involve energy intake, such as feeding, for example. Now, leptin is encoded by the OB gene and is an afferent signal from fat that uh, acts on the brain and participates in a negative feedback loop um, with the brain that can result in a reduction of fat mass. And how this works is that uh, when leptin is absent or low, um, and leptin tracks with the amount of fat you have, um, it signals to the brain to drive uh, behaviors that suppress energy expenditure and also to drive behaviors that increase energy intake, such as feeding. Now, conversely, uh, when, uh, when you have lots of fat, uh, leptin levels are high as well. And this has the opposite function of actually driving uh, energy expenditure um, by, uh, via things such as locomotion, but also to suppress feeding behavior as well. All right, so it's no surprise that uh, homozygous loss of the OB gene, um, as seen in the mouse on the right side, uh, results in a large number of energy expenditure defects that include the following. For example, defects in lipolysis, a lower body temperature than normal mice of about 35 degrees, and hypothermia, a thermogenic defect resulting in the inability to defend body temperature when the animal is uh, exposed to temperatures lower than thermal neutrality. Now, what's kind of interesting about these defects is that they're defects associated with adipose tissue. In particular, white fat, which secretes leptin, 
and whose primary function is the storage of chemical energy um, from lipids as uh, triglycerides, and also the provision of fuel for energy expenditure via the process of lipolysis. Now, brown fat, on the other hand, does not secrete leptin, and its primary function is, the mediating, uh, is to mediate heat production via the process of non-shivering thermogenesis, which involves the uncoupling of the mitochondrial proton gradient from ATP synthesis. All right, so we became um, interested, uh, and because of the thermogenic defects that I just described earlier, uh, we became interested in the role of leptin in these processes because of the uh, couple of uh, papers that came out in 2016. So in 2016, um, there were two papers that this, uh, it was, uh, so it was presumed for a very long time that acute leptin should act as a thermogenic reagent after it was discovered. And this is because of the thermogenic defects that I described earlier. However, in 2016, two reports came out um, that showed, uh, that suggested that acute leptin is not able to act as a thermogenic reagent. So this was work from uh, the Morton and the Nidergaard groups. And what they found there was that leptin does not increase energy expenditure even uh, or thermogenesis, even though um, these animals have normally functioning uh, brown adipose that can respond to an agonist. Now, this was kind of surprising to us because what was known very shortly after leptin was discovered in 1994 was that if you gave OB mice chronic leptin for days, for three weeks, um, you were able to correct all of its thermogenic defects, its energy expenditure defects. Um, and so we wondered, uh, you know, what could explain, you know, this difference between these uh, conflicting observations. So we set up the following experiment to sort of reconcile these uh, observations. And what we did here was we gave uh, leptin-deficient OB mice chronic leptin for two weeks using uh, osmotic pumps. Now, uh, and then we also compared these to mice that received an acute bolus of leptin. So um, what we did here was following uh, 14 days of leptin pump uh, infusion, uh, we removed the pumps and then on the, and we allowed these animals to rest for two days. And on the day of the experiment, uh, we gave the acute leptin group an IP injection of a large bolus of leptin, um, while the chronic leptin group just received uh, an injection of PBS. Now, we also included groups of animals that uh, only received PBS the entire time or wild-type lean mice. Now, on the 16th day um, after the injections, two hours after the injections, uh, we then tested for these animals' ability to carry out thermogenesis or lipolysis. All right, so what we were, um, so first let's look at what happens when we tested them for thermogenesis. So on the left, I'm showing you a thermographic camera images of these mice in the coal. Um, and you can see that the wild type animals were actually, uh, were generating heat as shown by the white um, in their brown fat. And the chronic leptin animals were very similar to that. On the other hand, the animals that received acute leptin uh, actually uh, acted more like as if they had not ever received leptin at all and were more similar to the PBS treated group. And this is better illustrated by a time course shown over here on the right, which shows that the chronic leptin treated animals were more similar to the lean mice and had normal thermogenic function and were able to defend their brown fat and core temperature, whereas the acute leptin treated animals were unable to do so. Now, furthermore, um, <coughs> if we look uh, following the cold uh, challenge or food restriction, we found that proteins that are important for thermogenesis or lipolysis, in this case, um, UCP1 uh, for thermogenesis, which is a marker for thermogenesis, uh, were increased in the chronic leptin-treated case, which is very similar to the wild-type animals, whereas the acute leptin-treated animals uh, did not increase in UCP1 expression. Uh, similarly, for the food-restricted mice, we found that um, Markers of lipolysis, in this case, the phosphorylation of hormone-sensitive lipase, uh, were only increased in the chronic leptin case, but not the acute leptin-treated animals. All right, so this made us wonder what could explain this chronological difference between the two groups. All right, so one common feature regulating both lipolysis and thermogenesis, in fact, is the sympathetic nervous system. Brown and white fat are innervated um, by axons from sympathetic neurons projecting uh, from 
uh, sympathetic ganglia proximal to the spine, which release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine into brown and white fat to drive uh, thermogenesis and lipolysis respectively. So we hypothesize that there could be morphological differences in the SNS innervating adipose tissue that could be responsible for the chronological differences that we saw earlier. Now, prior to this, it was very difficult to visualize structures within fat tissue uh, because of its high lipid content. And traditional histological studies involved using uh, paraffin embedded uh, fat uh, and sliced into thin sections, which enables only a limited sectional view of the structures within. So to overcome this challenge, we took advantage of a uh, tissue clearing technique developed in Paul Cohen's lab for visualizing the innervation inside of fat tissue so that one can visualize the nerves inside in a whole mouth imaging format using light sheet microscopy. Now, so using this technique, which is called a dipole clear, fat tissue becomes transparent such that now you can visualize the sympathetic innervation inside of it. Um, all right, so here I'm showing you, uh, so what do we see? So here I'm showing you a 3D reconstruction of uh, the fat, uh, the inguinal white fat from uh, wild type and leptin deficient OBOB mice uh, shown on the right and left. Now in green, you can see the sympathetic nerves inside of this fat tissue um, and also the vasculature that's stained in red by uh, the endothelial marker CD31. And what we saw was a profound reduction in innervation of this subcutaneous fat depot. Now, this was also observed in mice that had a defective leptin receptor. So these are not leptin deficient animals. Um, so just that the uh, defects in leptin signaling could result in this uh, profound reduction in sympathetic nerves. Now, because um, leptin was able, chronic leptin was able to restore the metabolic functions of OB mice, we wondered what would happen if we gave uh, leptin to these mice acutely or chronically. And so in my next slide, you can see what happens in the, to the nerves inside of this tissue. And we were surprised to find that um, in the chronic leptin-treated animals, there was a profound re uh, restoration of the innervation inside of the fat tissue. However, acute uh, delivery of leptin to this fat tissue did not actually restore the innervation as can be seen on the left side. And so this tells us that sympathetic innervation inside of fat tissue is actually quite plastic since we did these in adult animals. All right, so, um, uh, despite seeing this, it was important to actually control for the fact that um, leptin actually does suppress feeding. And so uh, leptin-treated OB mice actually lose weight when you give them leptin. And so what we did here to control for this weight loss is by treating, uh, pair feeding uh, OB mice uh, the same amount of food that leptin-treated animals received. And you can see on the right that these animals now lose weight as a result of this pair feeding. I'll also like to point out that parafed OB mice do not lose as much weight as leptin-treated animals, even though they're getting the same energy intake. So just that, that, that leptin has more uh, effects on energy expenditure outside of just um, the feature, uh, suppression of feeding. And what we saw there was that this weight loss caused uh, by the pair feeding actually did not, was not able to account for the innervation changes that we see from leptin. So just if that leptin has profound effects on innervation increase in OB mice. All right. So uh, furthermore, weight loss um, is unable to actually restore the thermogenic function that we saw in the chronic leptin-treated OB mice that we saw earlier. In fact, these parafed animals um, actually performed even worse when exposed to the cold. Um, suggestive that you know weight loss alone is not able to restore the bad thermogenic defects. All right, so to better understand the temporal dynamics of this innervation restoration by leptin, uh, we carried out a time course experiment uh, delivering leptin from between zero to 14 days to see how innervation changes over that period. And what we found there was uh, the restoration of sympathetic innervation in white fat, as shown on the top row, and brown fat on the bottom row is a very slow process that takes somewhere between seven to 14 days. Now, this uh, slow, time pro um, slow time course is important because it actually might provide an explanation for the difference that we observed earlier in the physiological effects of chronic and acute leptin on thermogenesis and lipolysis. Like 
So based on the data that we've collected, we know that innervation is restored only in the chronic leptin-treated OB mice, but not restored in the acute leptin-treated animals. And based on the early experiment we did with the thermogenesis, uh, testing for the ability to carry thermogenesis, uh, innervation restoration or normal innervation seems to correlate really well with whether these animals are able to carry out thermogenesis or not. And in fact, what was kind of interesting before our work was actually published, a review came out from the previous authors um, describing that leptin did not have these acute thermogenic uh, effects that speculated that perhaps um, uh, innervation, differences in innervation could explain the, um, the effects of the responsiveness of the adipose to, uh, to physiological androgenic stimulation of the tissue. Um, suggested that perhaps leptin might participate in um, the development or existence of proper innervation for the, these fat tissues, um, which was a very prescient sort of uh, uh, discovery and of course, um, you know, was really nice, uh, sort of supported what we had found here. All right, so I'll also like to point out another subtle point uh, that came about from this experiment which is that when uh, we gave leptin chronically for 14 days and removed the pumps from these animals, we're actually allowing the leptin, which has a half-life of about 40 minutes, to fully turn over. And what happens here is that by the time these chronic leptin animals are actually uh, being tested for the ability to carry out thermogenesis or lipolysis, there is actually no serum leptin inside of these animals, as can be seen by uh, the phosphostat three, uh, phosphorylation of stat three, which is a marker for leptin signaling uh, shown over here. And you can actually see that only the acute leptin treated animals have a, pho a, pho a phosphostat three response. And here on the right, I'm just showing you the serum levels of leptin. So this makes us, uh, this is highly suggestive of saying that perhaps serum leptin levels are not actually necessary for these adipose functions that I described but instead, innervation is actually what's needed to mediate this process. All right, to better explore um, how restoring innervation might affect uh, the function of fat tissue, uh, we wanted to know uh, if also this might actually affect sympathetic nerve activity, uh, which is actually what's really delivering the norepinephrine to fat tissue to drive thermogenesis and lipolysis respectively. So we enlisted the help of uh, uh, Ramoni Kamal and uh, Don Morgan at University of Iowa, uh, who are experts at measuring sympathetic nerve activity uh, from nerves that go into brown and white fat. And what we did there was we had chronic leptin treated OB mice, uh, just like I described before, and compared these two mice that received PBS the entire time. And on day 14, we moved the pumps again so that they have uh, negligible levels of serum leptin on the time when they're carrying out these measurements. And what we found there, uh, what they found there, was that the baseline sympathetic nerve activity uh, of chronic leptin animals was higher in both white fat and brown fat. And furthermore, if you took uh, these uh, animals and you cooled their body, cooled down their core body temperature, um, the responsiveness of chronic leptin treated animals was much greater than those that had received PBS the entire time. Suggestive that restoring innervation improves uh, both baseline and also the responsiveness of adipose sympathetic nerve activity. And uh, furthermore, we also looked and to see if restoring uh, adipose innervation also has effects on improving adipose metabolism. And what we did here was we looked at the oxygen consumption or the metabolism of fat uh, using a Clark electrode and found that chronic leptin treated animals. Uh, definitely responded much better um, the animals that did not receive leptin. Um, all right, so everything I have showed you up to now um, has basically uh, shown you that leptin regulates the plasticity and innervation of OB mice and, so, um, and subsequently their fat function as well. Now, this is most primarily in genetically obese animals, and we wanted to know. Um, if uh, it is also actually relevant to other forms of obesity, such as diet-induced obesity, because the OB, uh, OB, uh, OB humans are actually very rare, and actually that's because um, they're infertile. So what we did was we gave uh, normal mice a high-fat uh, Western diet, a 60% high-fat diet, uh, 
uh, that made them diet induced obese. You can see from the body weight curve from below, and found that high fat diet induced uh, uh, high fat diet induced obesity actually also resulted in a reduction in the amount of innervation inside of both white and brown fat. And and then additionally, I would like to point out that uh, work from Christy Townsend's group has also shown uh, that in human fat samples, there is also a reduction in innervation as well. All right, so before I continue, what I'd like to do is just quickly summarize uh, some of the findings that I've just described to you. First, I showed you that chronic but not acute leptin is able to restore the thermogenic and lipolysis functions of adipose tissue. Second, uh, leptin signaling deficiency seen in the OB mice uh, results in a profound loss in sympathetic innervation inside of fat tissue, and leptin can surprisingly restore the innervation to this tissue, showing that it is highly plastic. Finally, um, there is also reduced sympathetic innervation, like we see for genetic obesity, in mice that have um, high fat diet induced obesity as well. All right, so our findings over here showing the plasticity of innervation inside of fat um, were very reminiscent of some work that we had seen uh, done by Sebastian Barreau, who I understand gave a talk in this seminar series a couple of weeks earlier, uh, where he showed that leptin acts as a neurotrophic factor to drive ex increased axonal arborization in hypothalamic explants. Um, and so, uh, this work uh, definitely made us uh, think of what is leptin actually acting on um, in, uh, so, or rather, where is leptin site of action uh, driving these changes in innervation inside of fat? And so uh, we wanted to, to identify, to distinguish between the two sites, which would be, is leptin acting on its canonical site of action, uh, the brain? or is it directly acting on postganglionic sympathetic neurons that are directly innervated in fat? Uh, and to distinguish between these two groups, we decided to deliver leptin at levels that were too low to drive any sort of changes in the periphery uh, directly into the lateral ventricle by intracerebral ventricular injection um, directly into the brain. And we're, we were excited to find that uh, ICV leptin was sufficient to increase fat innervation telling us that the brain is the site of action for leptin on this, for this process. All right, so having identified the brain uh, that leptin is acting centrally to regulate innervation, we wanted to uh, identify which central leptin receptor neurons are participating in this process or, or is leptin site of action. And so to identify these neurons, we injected a replicative retrograde tracing pseudorabies virus, uh, or abbreviated as PRV, that expresses GFP directly into fat tissue. Now, this virus uh, is taken up by synaptic terminals inside of fat and travels retrogradely at the rate of one synapse per day. So on day one, it's taken up by those terminals. And on day two, uh, sympathetic postganglionic neurons now start to express PRV. And on day three, we now see expression of GFP showing that PRV is there. Uh, in the IML region of the spine. And starting on day four, we now start to see neurons within the brain start to express GFP. And if you do the injections uh, into leptin receptor tomato mice, so these are mice where leptin receptor expressing neurons express the tomato fluorescent protein, uh, we identified a number of regions um, that have leptin receptor and also have uh, GFP expression, showing that PRV has traveled there. In particular, these three regions caught our attention, and these include the MPO, the medial preoptic area, the uh, dorsal medial hypothalamus, and the arcuate nucleus, and these are all hypothalamic regions that uh, express the leptin receptor. All right, so um, to test, uh, you know, if any of these anatomical sites uh, might be involved in regulating innervation or part of leptin's uh, ability to do so, uh, we delivered, we deleted the leptin receptor from each of these anatomic sites by injecting adeno-assisted viruses expressing the Cree recombinase into uh, mice where the leptin receptor gene is surrounded by flanking LOX P sites or LEPAR flux mice. Now, uh, expression of Cree recombinase results in the excision of the leptin receptor gene 
And this results in an insensitivity to leptin, as shown by the loss of phosphostat-3 signaling when you inject leptin into these mice, as shown by the bottom row um, over here. All right, so, which of, uh, so following the loss of uh, leptin responsiveness uh, in these neurons, we then proceeded to look at the innervation inside of fat tissue. And specifically, what we found was that only the loss of leptin receptors from uh, leptin receptor neurons in the ARC uh, resulted in a reduction in sympathetic innervation from both white and brown fat. Now, this is interesting because this also tells, uh, supports the idea that innervation itself is quite plastic. And, and I say this because in the beginning, I showed you that we can increase innervation uh, from leptin deficient uh, OB mice. And in this case, now we are causing a loss of innervation um, from otherwise developmentally normal animals uh, by deleting their leptin sensitivity in the ARC. All right, so having identified the anatomic sites um, responding to leptin, uh, we wanted to know which specific neural subpopulations in the ARC uh, might mediate leptin's effects on regulating innervation. And in particular, there are two very well-studied populations of uh, neurons in the ARC uh, that respond to leptin uh, and the mediate a majority of leptin's effects. And these are the Propiomanellum cordin neurons, or POMC neurons, uh, that, are, um, that uh, are excited by leptin, and the AGRP or GUDI related peptide neurons that are inhibited by leptin. Now, uh, first, to identify if these neurons actually project polysynaptically to fat, we once again took advantage of that pseudo rabies virus uh, tracing, retrograde tracing strategy. Um, and found that both of these populations, uh, whether you inject PRV into brown fat or white fat, as shown by the left or right over here, um, both also project polysynaptically, uh, 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 retrogradely, at least uh, to the AGRP or the POMC neurons. All right, so following that, we decided to, uh, instead of uh, crossing these uh, AGRP Cree or POMC Cree animals to um, the leptin receptor flux mice, we instead took advantage of a different strategy to knock out the leptin receptor from each of these uh, neuronal populations. And this is using a CRISPR Cas9 uh, gene editing strategy uh, used by Dong Kong's group, who I believe he was previously at Tufts and now is at Harvard. Um, where what you do is you deliver AAVs that express a guide RNA to the leptin receptor into the arc of AGRP uh, Cas9 mice or POMC Cas9 mice. And now coincident expression of guide RNAs uh, together with Cas9 results in the loss of leptin receptor from these neurons and a subsequent insensitivity to leptin uh, as shown by the phosphostat-3 signaling um, over here in the middle row for each of these. All right, so having established that we can use this strategy to knock out the leptin receptor sensitivity uh, in these neuron populations, we then proceeded to look at how innervation is changed. And what you can see is that both of these populations result in a decrease in innervation uh, when leptin receptor is knocked out from either of these populations. And one thing I'll definitely like to point out over here, uh, and so this supports that AGRP and POMC neurons are both involved uh, or site of actions for leptin. And one thing I would like to point out over here is that the loss of innervation um, caused by loss of leptin receptor from either of these populations uh, results in a smaller effect than if you knocked out the entire leptin receptor from the entire arc, which um, could be explained either by the fact that perhaps both of these populations have a synergistic effect, or perhaps there is an alternate uh, population that may be involved in this process as well. All right. Okay, so um, having you know, shown you that the ARC is left in sight of action and you know, that the AGRP and POMC neurons are involved in this process, you know, it, it certainly makes us wonder if we can modulate um, or uh, the potential therapeutic use of leptin as a way to restore innervation and fat function in obese animals. Can we use this modulation of sympathetic nerves to treat obesity? Now, uh, although leptin, you know, when it was initially discovered, it was initially touted as a panacea for obesity, uh, 
its use as a therapeutic has been quite limited um, because most of these individuals are actually hyperleptinemic, so they have high leptin levels. And also they have an insensitivity to leptin. Uh, phenotype that is called uh, leptin resistance, which is highly analogous to uh, insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. And in fact, uh, this reduced sensitivity to leptin is shown by a reduction in uh, STAT3 phosphorylation um, in the hypothalamus, uh, which is actually what happens when you feed mice high fat diet for four months. And you can see this over in the bottom row over right here. And in fact, these results correlate with the reduced innervation that I showed you earlier. Um, that, and in fact, these were the same animals, um, suggestive that perhaps the high fat diet induced uh, leptin resistance could be one explanation for the reduced innervation that we observe in both white and brown fat. And in fact, this reduced innervation itself, which is important for fat function and energy expenditure, may also explain why it is difficult to immobilize fat tissue in obese individuals. All right, so this sort of leaves us with a bit of a bummer because you know, it, it doesn't really provide us with an uh, opportunity for you know, treating obesity. But we wondered if perhaps we might be able to bypass this leptin resistance and diet-induced obesity if, for example, uh, we could identify um, downstream elements uh, of this process, um, uh, you know, of le how leptin is able to drive energy expenditure this way. And so um, we, we would like to know what are the downstream nodes. And I will also point out that um, the leptin receptor, uh, you know, the HRP and POMC neurons in the ARC, uh, most of their projections are actually within the brain. And so it's highly suggestive that there might be another node or multiple nodes um, that could be projecting directly to preganglionic neurons in the spine, uh, which subsequently will also send signals to postganglionic neurons directly in the fat. Now, okay, so, so where do we look for these downstream nodes? Um, so uh, for the, the last part of this talk, um, what I'd like to do is tell you about a role for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, uh, as perhaps this downstream node. And we became interested in the role for BDNF um, because of this paper in 2001, which showed that if you deliver brain, BDNF directly into the brain of uh, obese diabetic mice, these are DBD mice, which have a mutant insensitive leptin receptor, you were able to drive an enhancement of USB1 expression, which is that thermogenic gene uh, found in brown fat, and increased body temperature, both at the core and brown fat, and also an increase in norepinephrine turnover inside of brown fat. So these are like sympathetic responses. So just if that somehow BDNF delivered into the brain is bypassing leptin resistance to mediate brown fat thermogenesis. So we wondered if it could play a role in this process. And so what we did was, uh, and so what I'll also point out is that there are lots of human studies supporting a role for BDNF in a human obesity, um, uh, where if you have haploid insufficiencies in trek B, which is BDNF's receptor, or a loss in BDNF expression, reduction in BDNF expression, uh, this can also result in human obesity as well. All right, so to test for a role for BDNF in this process, we decided to follow what that previous paper had done and delivered BDNF directly by ICV into the brain. And we were happy to find that this was sufficient to increase fat innervation, uh, both at, from white fat and brown fat. Now, although this was uh, very exciting, it doesn't really tell us um, if it's uh, part of the same pathway as leptin. And so to, to test for this, uh, we delivered um, a, an antagonist to trek B, which is BDNF's receptor, directly into the brain followed by co-delivering leptin directly subcutaneously into OB mice. And what we found there was brain-wide delivery of this TRK-B antagonist actually blunted the effects of leptin on increasing innervation inside of white and brown fat, suggestive that perhaps BDNF signaling might be part of this pathway to downstream of leptin. All right, so these results are were quite exciting, um, but they are, they, you know, because here what we're doing is delivering BDNF or the, the 
antagonists throughout the brain, it doesn't really tell us where the source of BDNF is coming from. And so we wanted to know where are BDNF neurons. Um, and there's actually been quite a lot of work uh, linking leptin signaling to BDNF expression, uh, expressing neurons uh, in the brain, in particular in the hypothalamus, uh, where here I'm showing you an uh, example of two regions that express the leptin receptor, such as the ARC and the dorsomedial hypothalamus that I talked about earlier, um, and, other, and two regions that express BDNF, uh, which include the ventral medial nucleus um, and also the paraventricular hypothalamus. Um, and in particular, we were drawn to the PVH, uh, the paraventricular hypothalamus, because of some work uh, done by Bautzi Shi's lab um, in 2015 showing that BDNF expressing neurons uh, play a role in driving brown fat thermogenesis via the IML and postcanclean neurons. And we were, uh, you know, we thought the PVH would be an interesting site to look at, also because it's actually a pre-autonomic um, projecting area. And if you inject the PRVs into fat and you do the retrograde tracing, as I described earlier, it's actually one of the first few sites that shows up from this retrograde tracing. So it's toge uh, together with the RPA, these are the first two sites that pop up in day four. Um, and so what we did was we checked if BDNF expressing neurons in these areas, in, in the PVH, uh, might co-localize with PRVs that travel retrograde from brown and white fat. And we're happy to see that they did. All right, so furthermore, um, if you deliver leptin to OB mice, um, you also see an increase in CFOS expression in BDNF neurons inside the PVH. Um, and CFOS here is a marker of neuronal activity, suggesting that leptin is driving activity of these neurons. You also actually see an increase in BDNF transcript expression in the PVH when you give leptin to these animals as well. So these uh, two features uh, made us excited to try to delete BDNF from the PVH. And we did this by delivering Cree recombinase via AV again into mice where the BDNF is surrounded by flanking MOX P sites. Um, and we found there that this resulted in a reduction in adipose sympathetic innervation, suggestive that BDNF neurons in the PVH might play a role in regulating innervation. Now, this doesn't actually tell us if they are downstream of the ARC. Um, so what we did also was we carried out monosynaptic rabies uh, so, uh, monosynaptic rabies tracing to try uh, to look retrogradely. And we found that ARC, uh, AGRP and POMC neurons in the ARC project monosynaptically to the PVH, these BDNF neurons in the PVH. And we also saw that BDNF neurons in the PVH project to um, trek B expressing neurons in the pre, uh, pre ganglion neurons in the spine as well. All right. so. Um, all of this was nice and it supports that perhaps leptin, uh, BDNF neurons in the PVH are downstream of leptin signaling. And so to test if they really do have a role, we decided to uh, blade BDNF expressing neurons in the PVH of OB mice using a Cree-dependent diphtheria toxin A um, expressing A and V. Now, so when Cree uh, is present, Cree recombinase is present and you deliver this uh, DTA, um, it causes these neurons to be ablated, and you can see that there is now a loss of BDNF expressing neurons in the PVH. All right, so what happens when these OB mice uh, receive leptin? All right, so when we gave them, uh, before giving them leptin, uh, you can see that their body weights are actually very similar uh, between those wh which have lost their BDNF neurons or those that, didn't, uh, that still have their BDNF neurons present. However, once you start giving them leptin, you can now see that the body weight curves start to diverge between these two groups, uh, suggestive that, le uh, that loss of these neurons is blocking leptin's effect and driving the increase in energy expenditure. And when you now look at the innervation inside of this fat tissue, um, you can see that if these neurons are still present, leptin is still able to increase innervation inside of white and brown fat. But when you delete them, now you've blunted leptin's effects on innervation. They're more similar to those that never ever received leptin as well. Supporting that 
the BDNF neurons in the PVH have downstream of leptin uh, receptor expressing neurons in the bark. All right, so to summarize, I told you about how leptin, uh, which is produced by white fat, acts, uh, has, uh, acts on leptin receptor neurons uh, in the arcuate nucleus. And subsequently, BDNF expressing neurons in the PVH, which project neurons to uh, project to pregangliate neurons in the IML, and subsequently send signals to sympathetic postganglionic neurons in the spine that directly innervate um, the white and brown fat. Um, and so, uh, although I've told you about the what, where, and how uh, leptin seems to be doing this. Um, I haven't really actually sort of discussed anything about why perhaps innovation in fat might actually be plastic. And so I'd like to spend a couple of seconds uh, discussing this. And so, for, so why should it be plastic, right? We know that fat size is actually quite dynamic, right? And, um, and can actually change quite dramatically in terms of the, you know, the tissue size, uh, uh, either via, either via hypertrophy or hyperplasia of adipose uh, in response to the amount of nutritional availability, right? So how much you eat will not determine how much fat size is there present. And so, um, you know, it, if you increase in the amount of fat tissue you have, um, but you're only partially innervating your tissue, then you're not actually properly utilizing this entire tissue. And so, we think a mechanism for allowing the innervation to be plastic is important for successful utilization of uh, fat as it changes in size. And furthermore, you know, one could ask, why would you use uh, leptin for this purpose right? instead of any number of other hormones that might be able to fulfill a similar function? So as I alluded to at the beginning of my talk, um, leptin levels increase with adiposity. Right, so the amount of leptin that you, the brain is seeing actually increases when you become fatter. So in many ways, it's actually a really ideal proxy for the amount of fat present um, and also the amount of innervation required. And in many ways, this is very similar to the concept of systems matching, uh, where the end organ is uh, ensuring that the amount of innervation it receives is appropriate for the demand and size of um, much like the much for the demand and size of the tissue, much like the role that NGF or neuronal growth factor plays in organ innovation. And in fact, how might this actually be related to classic nerve growth? And you know, uh, as I just mentioned, you know, the most well-studied example of nerve growth or innervation of organs is that of nerve growth factor, which Rita Montalcini discovered in, uh, and won the Nobel Prize in 1986 for, where how it works is that uh, nerve growth factor is secreted by the target organ, in this case, uh, sarcoma, uh, which drives the axons of the neuron to grow towards it. And this is what is known as a bottom-up target-derived mechanism for nerve growth. And in fact, there were two papers from Diane Matthies and Bruce Spiegelman's group, uh, which showed a very similar type of bottom-up target-derived mechanism where brown fat is secreting something that drives uh, the innervation to increase um, of the tissue. Now, in our case, uh, it's a little different from this because uh, leptin is acting not directly on these neurons, but then is acting on the arc, all right? It's acting directly on the brain. So in some sense, this is a top-down, uh, but also still target-derived mechanism because leptin is, um, is secreted by fat, which is being coming innervated. Um, and so we're now, uh, and so the signals are coming uh, directly from the brain to, you know, to these IML neurons, these pre and post ganglion neurons. And so we're now taking a bunch of profiling strategies to try to identify what is what are these signals that are being used to drive nerve growth. All right, so um, I'd like to also comment uh, that perhaps you know our finding that adipose innervation is plastic might not actually be as surprising as I you know, said earlier. And you know, when we think of neuronal plasticity in the brain, for example, um, outside of development, <coughs> we often, uh, this is usually constrained to synaptic plasticity and dendritic plasticity, instead of the axonal plasticity um, that I have showed you in fact. Um, and this is because it has these constraints uh, because we wanna uh, 
preserve the anatomical connections between uh, different anatomical regions between the brain. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the periphery, such a constraint might actually not be so important, right? Because the tissue is actually uh, changing quite a lot. And in fact, most of the tissue, the cells inside of the tissue turn over or are remodeled, um, which, and perhaps, you know, these constraints might not actually be so relevant and maybe, you know, actually nerve remodeling might be actually a very common thing actually. Additionally, I wanna also say that, you know, uh, peripheral nerves have a tremendous capacity uh, for plasticity. And, you know, I think one good example that we all can all relate to is the transplanting of organs, right, into, from one person to another. Uh, and these can become re over time. So just tell, you know, telling us how plastic these peripheral nerves really are. All right, so in summary, you know, our study describes this plasticity of innervation inside of fat tissue. And it's joined by a very large number of studies and growing number of studies um, describing nerve remodeling inside um, these different metabolic organs. And it's part, this work is, uh, a lot of this work has been enabled by tissue clearing techniques uh, that enable the 3D imaging of the structures within them. Now, a lot of these studies have focused um, on interactions between the neurons and the innervation tissue um, and looking at their neuronal activity. And these, uh, and and I think these newer studies highlight that there's not just changes in the neuronal activity, but also uh, dynamic structural plasticity um, uh, in nerve architecture. And some of these uh, studies, uh, in fact, many of these studies are actually comorbid with um, uh, metabolic disease states, such as obesity and diabetes. And so not only, it remains to be determined whether this nerve remodeling that we're seeing here occurs just in pathologic, uh, especially in pathological conditions, is a contributing factor to the pathogenesis, or perhaps it's just a bystander uh, of the pathogenesis. And I think subsequent studies will be very important for uncovering the mechanisms driving nerve modeling, uh, putting a mechanism to many of these uh, descriptive studies in the future. All right, and with that, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, all of the people in the Friedman Lab and you know, particularly these individuals who have made a lot of this work possible. Um, and also on the right are my funding sources. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. And you know, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Uh, so it's quite fascinating. I, I have a few questions, but I'll save them for <laughs> afterwards. And we have so we have already one from the audience. So is there from this is a question from Zita Santos? Is there a way of ablating the adipose tissue innervation in a leptin independent way? Ablation for for. So so there uh, you can ablate the uh, the innervation inside of the tissue. Um, people usually use things like uh, six hydroxy dopa to do so. Um, and, and there, what we found actually was that the innervation, um, we, we didn't put this in our paper, but, uh, we did find it come back, but it was sort of kind of, uh, all over the place. So yeah, that's why it's not in there. Um, and I, I think that's because when you use such strategies to ablate the neurons, um, it's hard to know, uh, if you're successfully ablating all of the, the, the neuro, the nerves inside of the tissue, unless you go out and clear it and image it. Um, and, and so it's hard to know if you have a successful ablation versus, you know, you know, the, those neurons actually regrew from the, as a result of leptin. I see. Okay. I think, uh, for now, I think we already have another one that just jumped. So we have a question from Raquel Barajas Aspoleta, and she, she asks, what would happen to people who do liposuction? Would they become obese? Um... Well, I, I guess when you're you're carrying out liposuction, I'm I'm sure you're, you know, you're pulling out all of the fat and you're taking out all of the nerves. Lip. Right, the blood, the vasculature, everything's being removed. Um, you're not removing those postganglion neurons because um, they're actually very very far from the tissue. Um, in fact, actually, one thing that's pretty remarkable is the fact that those neurons are innervating an organ that's you know, centimeters away from the cell bodies, right? The cell bodies are like near the spine. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yeah, I don't know if they could regrow back there, um, but you know, that's, that, yeah, that would be kind of 
interesting to note, you know, for example, if you remove it, then is the fat sort of going to be metabolically um, less active as a result? Yeah. Because I was also wondering, because you mentioned too that uh, taking out the fat, fat could sh the fat, the, the amount of fat is correlated with the amount of leptin. So maybe just taking out the fat kind of reduces the leptin levels per se, and these people become less leptin resistant. I was just wondering now. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think there's there's been a lot of work, there, or at least at least the, the mechanisms for leptin resistance are still kind of um, mysterious in the sense that you know, I see. yeah. I, I think what's better appreciated is that, that there's definitely a reduced sensitivity, which is what we're showing. Yes. Um, but whether you know what is the true mechanism of leptin resistance, or you know. It's yes, both. I see. I see your point. It's not as easy as saying levels of leptin changing. It's more right because more because complex. yeah 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 yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and Raquel was saying that, that in the chat. That's what she was hinting at. Okay, so mm -hmm. we have another question from Ritu, uh, and the question is: What is the time scale of the turnover of innovation? Since leptin levels would dynamically change with hunger and satiety during the day, would the innovation change as well? Oh, I love this question. Do, do feds like intermittent fasting change this innovation dynamic potentially? Right, right. So, so that's obviously um, an important question. Um, so the time scales, as I showed you, were like really, really slow. Um, you know, like like those were days, uh, weeks, actually, one week at least for in mice. That are highly responsive to leptin, actually. Um, so there's clearly some kind of discrepancy between, uh, you know, the the, the dynamic changes in leptin levels that are sort of circadian, um, right? Which is kind of what you would imagine here, um, and 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 when you have leptin given for a very very long period of time, you know. The, so 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 we're not sure how uh, it can sense this, but but I think even you know, work from example like uh, Lisa Butler, who who gave a talk I think here a couple of weeks ago. You know, she's shown that um, the what's always been very puzzling for the leptin field is you know how slow leptin's effects are on a lot of like energy expenditure or metabolic function. Um, and so there must we, we suspect that you know there's a mechanism that responds to the dynamic changes that occur during the day. But they're all, in fact, I, I would argue actually that that actually the dynamic changes in in you know food consumption, et cetera, like such as hunger and satiety, are probably more likely mediated via things like ghrelin, uh, whereas leptin has a much more longer term, very slow effect, you know, yeah, cumulative effect um, that cannot be seen, uh, in, you know, from these fast behaviors, and and perhaps that's why. You know, leptin is not a very good uh, appetite suppressant in people with lots of leptin, right? Yeah. Yes, makes total sense. So we have a few more questions. So we have one from Claudia Colina. And the question is, does the contrary will help people affected with lipodystrophy? Lipodystrophy, um, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Right, so, so the contrary to... Does the contrary? I, I don't. I, I'm not sure. Um, I guess the contrary of what you've done um, will help people affected with lipodystrophy. Right. I so guess. I guess, in, in, and when you're lipodystrophic, you, you don't have fat, right? Um, so it's so changing I, the innovation the other way around. It's, yeah. Or something but, like but that. I guess, I guess, in this case, you know, well, does. We can't really look at the innovation file if you don't have that. Um, true. Yeah. True. True. So we have a final question, uh, which uh, which is from Kanim. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Kanya Mibwa Arsen. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, possible naive question, but at some point you said you injected a very low amount of leptin inside the mice brain for one of your experiments. How was low defined? Right. Um, so, so uh, I, I'm assuming you're referring to the ICV experiment where we delivered leptin directly into the brain um, uh, instead of, well, subcutaneously, which was how we did it. So the difference is about 50 times, and um, people have done these titration experiments where 
if you deliver uh, leptin levels at the amount that we use for the ICV injections, um, if you give it subcutaneously, there's basically no effect uh, on like any kind of metabolic function, uh, energy expenditure, et cetera. Um, and so they're so low that they just don't work in the periphery. Um, and also if you give it in the brain, you don't actually see it leak out you know, into the periphery. So that, that's kind of how we define UL. And, and lots of studies have used these numbers before. Cool. Okay, so I think for now, these are all the questions. Um, we still we, we will still have time for more. So if people are interested, you can join the Q&A session that will start soon in a couple of minutes. Um, and this was a really great talk. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity. Was, this is great. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Oh, oh I, sorry. I said thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm having some <laughs> internet issues. Okay. It was really lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, so next week we will have uh, Marcelo Dieterich, uh, and he will tell us about the development of regulatory brain-body interaction systems. So stay tuned for that. Um, and once again, thank you once again. Uh, it was a really lovely talk. And if people have more questions, feel free to join the Zoom link that I, I dropped in the chat. See you all next week. And once again, thank you. Ken.